Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Stephen Hales. He is professor and chair of the Department of Philosophy at Bloomsburg University in the US. His areas of specialization include epistemology and metaphysics. He is the author of books like Metaphysics, A Companion to Relativism, Nietzsche's Perspectivism, and this is philosophy. So, Dr. Hales, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Okay, so today we're going to talk about uh, luck or the philosophy of luck, right? And also a little bit about relativism and perspectivism. So let me start with luck, because I guess that uh, when we talk about things <coughs> from a philosophical perspective, they do not always correspond to how people uh, think about them commonly. So when people think about luck, perhaps it's not exactly the same as people approach it in philosophy, right? So could you tell us what luck is about and perhaps also the difference between uh, moral luck and epistemic luck? Okay, sure. Well, I, I think one of the interesting things about luck, as you just pointed out, is that people outside of philosophy are widely interested in this. And, you know, in ancient times, luck was thought to be a kind of force or a kind of power or something that was distributed capriciously by the gods, right? And so, you know, uh, so ancient people had a, a variety of different methods to try to deal with this, you know, propitiating the deities or some kind of uh, you know, we would have potions or, or good luck charms or these kinds of ideas. And it wasn't really until the Renaissance and the development of probability theory that people started to get handles on other ways to address and understand luck. <clears throat> or, or people thought that we were fated. And so there's this kind of um, tension between the idea of, of having a destiny, of having fate, and yet at the same time our lives being capricious or chancy. Uh, <clears throat> Now, philosophers currently are interested in luck in a variety of different ways, uh, both epistemic luck and moral luck, as you pointed out. So the, the problem of epistemic luck is, well, I, I think there's a variety of problems of epistemic luck, but the way in which luck seems to interfere with our possession of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And this seems a little bit surprising. So... The classic example is Gettier cases, right? Where, for instance, uh, suppose I decide to check the time by looking at a clock, a usually reliable clock, and I look at the clock and it says it's 10 o'clock, and the clock is correct, it's 10 o'clock. So you, you think on the one hand, I've got knowledge by this little interaction, right? <clears throat> I looked at a usually reliable clock, I correctly concluded from that that, that the time was 10 o'clock, but suppose the clock is stopped. We all know that stopped clocks are right twice a day. So it, it was just by luck that I looked at it at that time when it was actually 10 o'clock. So it seems like I don't have knowledge. <clears throat> but that's kind of bothersome because it, it, on the one hand, it looks like I did everything right and yet somehow still did not get knowledge out of it just because of having bad luck. Or I think there's other kinds of uh, ways of understanding traditional philosophical problems like skepticism. So if you think about the familiar radical skeptical arguments like Descartes' dream argument or something like this, where you might think, well, it's just good luck in a sense that I'm not in a skeptical world where I'm being massively deceived. Well, <clears throat> if it's just good luck that somehow my ordinary perceptions are connecting me up with reality, how is that providing me with knowledge, right? So there's a way of understanding skepticism is just another version of a luck problem. Mm -hmm. So those are a couple of different ways. Or I think there's also a kind of circumstantial luck that arises in epistemology where I'm fortunate to be in a kind of position where the views that I take seriously as possibilities for the truth are in fact with the truth is within the, that realm of possible options. So there might be uh, perhaps 
be, because of the way that I'm enculturated or uh, my surroundings or my society that I just write off as too outlandish or too far-fetched uh, theories and scenarios that are in fact part of the truth. Uh, so it's good luck that maybe I'm enculturated in a way that I have access to the truth. And that, you know, we ought to think about that and see how that works, too. So, I mean, that's kind of on the epistemic side of the house. Mm -hmm. And you had asked me about moral luck. Right. So <clears throat> uh, moral luck arises, and this is coming out of the, the work from uh, Thomas Nagel and Bernard Williams, in a variety of different ways. So one is a kind of outcome luck. So, so moral luck has to do with the idea that luck alone might increase my blameworthiness or praiseworthiness for an action. And that seems surprising because you think whether we're praiseworthy or blameworthy for what we do just has to do with what we do and our intentions and our motives and you know our character and that kind of business, not with luck. Um, but it seems to. So, I mean, one sort of classic example is that of the pair of drunk drivers. So you imagine two different people who they've had too much to drink at a party and they drive home anyway. One gets home safely. And you might think, well, they're kind of blameworthy for what they did. They did something wrong. But it wasn't that bad. They're not that blameworthy. Whereas the other person, a supposed pedestrian, runs out in front of their car and they hit the pedestrian and they kill them or injure them, you think, well, they're really blameworthy for what they did, even though it was just bad luck that the pedestrian ran in front, you know? Right. And that seems kind of surprising. So there's other kinds of instances of uh, moral luck as well that seem to affect praise and blame in surprising ways. Mm -hmm. So when it comes <coughs> to moral luck, does it relate in any way, shape or form with uh, the ways that, that people think about uh, dispositional and situational aspects of other people's behavior and if they deserve or not what happens to them? Uh, yes, <clears throat> I, I see what you're saying because if you think that moral luck is a matter of luck affecting your praiseworth one's praiseworthiness or blameworthiness, then presumably the way that that person would be treated by others would also be, or properly treated by others, would be an outcome of luck as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And so uh, you referred very briefly in your first answer to several different approaches, perhaps, that we have in philosophy to both types of luck. So, would you like to tell us, perhaps, what are some of the most prevalent approaches or theories in the philosophy of luck that we have nowadays? Sure, sure. So, I really, I, I think there's three main ways that people think about luck now. One is to say, and, and this is how all the mathematicians think about it. And, and, and if you read them, you read the scientists, they think, well, we just solved what luck is. It's just about probability. If we master the theorems of probability and, uh, you know, uh, understand them, then we know everything there is to know about luck. And I don't think that's quite right, but it's still a prominent approach to think of luck just in terms of improbability. So you, uh, an event is lucky for you just in case it was improbable and it was significant to you in some sort of way. The significance clause seems to matter because there's all kinds of improbable things that happen, uh, right? It's improbable that there's a, that I see a black pebble on my walk back to my car, but it's not a matter of luck because I don't care, right? Uh, so that part seems to matter. Another idea is that it's not so much improbability that explains luck, but it's modality. So the idea is, that an event that is modally fragile, that is to say, could have easily gone another way, that that seems like a matter of luck in a way that a modally robust event, that is to say, an event that could not have easily been different, uh, it, it seems to be lucky. So, for instance, here's how, here's the difference between the probability view and the modal view. Imagine somebody who plays the lottery, a fair lottery, and they lose. Okay. Now, would you say that they were unlucky to lose or not? Well, if you're a probability theorist, you'll say, look, it's just what you expect. 
I mean, it's not a matter of bad luck to lose the lottery. We all expect to lose the lottery, right? But for a modal theorist, that may not be right. So the world might have been very slightly different and you would have won. Like, suppose just one number had changed and you would have been a winner. So it seems like a tiny change in the world uh, would have allowed you to win. So it does seem like bad luck in that sense. So that's kind of the difference between those two. And the, the third prominent view is the idea of a lack of control. So <clears throat> this is what people who work on moral luck, would they, they love this idea. So the idea would be that when something is out of your control, then it's a matter of luck. When it is within your control, then, it, then it's not. Yes, but with that last approach, I guess that uh, deciding what is really uh, <clears throat> what is really beyond our control or under our control, I mean, it's not that easy, right? I completely agree with you. And one of the things I've been working on most recently is to try to show that the control view in fact entails either the modal view or the probability view, which is kind of bad news for those people. Because if you think about what it is to be in control of something, you think it's inversely related to its chanciness. So the more that you're in control of an event, the, it seems like the, the less chancy that event is, right? The more chancy it is, the less you'd say it's a matter of control. So it looks like it's tied into this chanciness, you know, either probabilistically or modal um, idea of chanciness in some sort of way. Mm -hmm. Right. So earlier in the interview, I asked you about uh, the relationship between perhaps the approaches that people have to other people's behavior in terms of attributing it to dispositional factors or situational factors. But when it comes to luck, we also have synchronic and diachronic luck and the ways people uh, approach each of them uh, and, and the ways people look at how events unfold over time. I mean, it differs, right? Yes, yes. In fact, this is something that I think is kind of neglected and people haven't thought enough about, which is whether we consider an event to be a lucky one really has to do with whether we're viewing it in isolation or whether we're viewing that event as part of a series. And so one example is playing a slot machine. So on a typical slot machine, there's three spinning reels, right? You pull the handle and the reels spin, and then they stop at different times. So uh, these are sometimes called fruit machines around here uh, right? because they'll have pictures of fruit on them. You want them all to line up. So, I mean, if, if you pull the handle and the reel starts to spin and you get a lemon, you think, well, that's not lucky. I mean, the two other reels are still spinning. It's not lucky to get a lemon. doesn't matter. You need three to match. Well, the second one stops on lemon. You think, was well, that lucky? Well, again, it doesn't really matter. You don't get a payout unless you have three lemons. All right, but if the third one stops on a lemon, you think, okay, that is very lucky. The third reel to stop on a lemon seems uncommonly lucky because now you have the payout. But that's only as you, if you view that as part of that series. If you view the real stopping on its own in isolation, well, it's just a lemon. I mean, that, you know, that isn't lucky on its own. It's only as part of the series that it's lucky. So was the third real stopping on a lemon lucky or not lucky? Well, viewed, you know, at a moment in time, then no viewed as part of a series, then yes. What's the right way to view it? I mean, a, a theory of luck like the probability view isn't going to tell me uh, which it is. So I, I think that's bothersome. Mm -hmm. Yes, and when it comes to the example of the slot machine and the lemons, I mean, we could even we could even look back and say that perhaps the first lemon was the lucky one because if we didn't get that one, right. then the rest doesn't matter. Right. That's exactly right. So they're all independently necessary and jointly sufficient for the win. So there's no reason to say that the last one was any luckier than the first one. You're entirely right. But there's that feeling that it's luckier, right? Now, now I'm lucky. I'm hoping for that last one, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's like tossing a coin in the air and people don't really tend to think about the probabilities separately, but they think that it is impossible, for example, to get 
eight straight heads or eight straight tails, right? Instead of thinking that perhaps each time you toss the coin, there's a 50-50 probability of getting heads or tails, right? Right, that's exactly right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, so uh, <coughs> do people also look at lucky events or at luck in general? Uh, does it differ if people are optimists or pessimists about uh, the uh, world, let's say? Absolutely, and I'm glad you asked about that because uh, I recently did some work with uh, my colleague Jen Johnson on this very topic, and we had hypothesized that in the case of ambiguous luck scenarios that optimists would view them in one kind of way and pessimists in another. So here's uh, one of the examples that we used, and this is a 100% true story. Tsutomu Yamaguchi was uh, a draftsman for Mitsubishi Heavy Industries during the Second World War, and he lived in Japan, and he designed uh, oil tankers. Well, his bosses had sent him on a business trip to Hiroshima, where he'd spent all summer of 1945 until August, when the atomic bomb dropped. Even though he was within the instant death zone, he somehow managed to survive with burns, ruptured eardrums, and, you know, he's injured, but he survived. And so he went back home to Nagasaki, okay? <laughs> and he is literally meeting with his boss to tell him the story of a single bomb that destroyed an entire city, and his boss is saying, that is the craziest thing I ever... Boom! And the atomic bomb over Nagasaki detonates. He survives that, and he lives to be 93. So, do you say he was lucky or unlucky? Well, it turns out the optimists, and there's ways of testing for this that psychologists have developed, the optimists say, well, that guy was lucky. I mean, my God, he survived two atomic bombs. How, you know, But the pessimists will say, that's got to be the unluckiest man who ever lived. He was atomic bomb twice. What do you want? You know? <clears throat> and then we had several other cases and got pretty robust results on this. So I, you know, I, I think that was very interesting that the very same case, you see it as a matter of good luck or bad luck, sort of depending on idiosyncratic personal traits. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's very interesting. And let's now talk a little bit about relativism, because I guess that relativism also has several different dimensions to it. We can talk about, for example, also epistemic relativism or moral relativism. And when it comes to the epic, epistemic side of relativism, applying it, for example, to science, religion, politics, and several and many, very, very many things. So, w would you like first to tell us what relativism is about in a general way? Sure. So, in general, uh, relativistic theories believe that. Well, I I'll just focus on discussing relativism about truth to, to make it easy, uh, that truth is somehow indexed to some kind of perspectival parameter or to a point of view or something along these lines. And people very often think that truth is indexed, the, the truth of a sentence is indexed to the language in which it appears or indexed to times or to possible worlds. Relativists want to add to that that it's furthermore indexed to something like a perspective. And, of course, you might be a relativist in many different domains. You might think that moral relativism is true, for instance, that, let's say, uh, the truth of moral claims is uh, indexed to cultures or, you know, some other kind of uh, point of view. Or you might think that it's true about epistemic uh, claims in general or, you know, political claims. So, I mean, th there's different ways of being a relativist. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, one of the first charges that people come up with and put against relativism when discussing the subject is that it is in some way self-refuting. So, do you think that we can have some way of getting beyond that charge or not? Right. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the charge of self-refutation is the classic one, going back to Plato. And I think there are a variety of ways to try to approach. I mean, the one that I'm partial to is this. If you think about 
perspectives or points of view as kind of analogous to possible worlds, that this gives us a way to understand how the logic of relativism might operate. So pretty much no one wants to say that everything is possible. However, people are happy to say that everything true is possibly true, right? And I think it, there's an analogous move to be made about relativism, where maybe we don't want to say that everything is relative, which leads to a kind of self-refutation problem, but if we say that everything true is relatively true, well, that sounds a lot less threatening, but still kind of a robust relativism, which is to say that every truth has this kind of perspectival parameter. And I think that that gets around this self-refutation objection. I mean, there's some uh, technical, formal stuff to be worked out about this, but that's sort of the general approach. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, wh when it comes to relativism, le let me ask you now, what is the relationship between it and perspectivism? Because I is there any real important difference there or not? That's a, that's a really good question. And both of them are sort of terms of art where there are p writers who use perspectivism to really mean a kind of relativism. But there's also a strain of work on perspectivism where it tries to mark out something a little bit different. So, for instance, if you read Nietzsche when he talks about perspectivism, I, I think that he has in mind a kind of host of interconnected views, including a kind of relativism about truth, a sort of bundle theory of the self, an anti-realism about metaphysics, and th there's all these things tied together that he labels perspectivism as this right. cluster concept. In the philosophy of science, perspectivism is doing something a little bit different than relativism, where you may think that there are um, perspectival truths which are not reducible to other kinds of truths. For instance, if you may think that certain biological phenomena are emergent and in the sense that maybe biology is not uh, reducible in some sense to uh, physics or to chemistry because biological phenomena are emergent phenomena. It's still a scientific enterprise, but we would need to have that perspective of biology in addition to the perspectives of chemistry and physics to truly understand the material world. So that's a kind of perspectivism there that's not a relativism. I mean, it's not being, there's not a, a point of view to which truths are indexed, right. but rather we have that kind of um, idea that there are these non-reducible facts in certain domains. So in that sense, I think perspectivism is different from relativism. And do you think that it is possible for someone to be truly behaviorally or pragma pragmatically relativist or relativistic? Because, I mean, it is easy to imagine at, an, at a purely intellectual level for people to be relativists. But when it comes really to their behavior, it's, it's really hard to believe that there, uh, that someone would really behave in a relativistic way. I, I'm not sure if I'm being clear here or not, but... I, I think I see where you're going with that, that as a matter of practicality, mm -hmm. how can you suggest that maybe the truths that you adopt aren't superior to the truths that someone else may accept, or something along those lines? Right. No, I, I take your point. It seems to me that it might be easier in some domains than others. For instance, if you are a relativist about artistic merit, perhaps you think that, well, uh, I, I understand from some points of view that this is a fine painting and other points of view it's not a fine painting, but that doesn't somehow prevent you from saying, here's the style of painting that I prefer, this is what I like and this is what I enjoy and I think that this is a great work of art. Even fully acknowledging that someone else from a different point of view would deny what you're saying. So look, I, I know that you don't like Kandinsky or whatever. Uh, you don't like that style. Well, that's fine. It's a great work of art. That's true for me. You don't think it's true for you. I mean, uh, it seems to me that's not too hard to live with. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when it comes to the relationship between relativism and morality, I guess that there is one big aspect 
where relativism might have a, an important role to play. That is, I think, the fact that it seems to me at least that when philosophers in particular uh, talk about morality and ethics, they rely a lot on intuitions or what sometimes people call intuitionism. And sometimes it even uh, resembles what, what theologian, theologians do with revelation and things like that. So w would you agree with that or not? Yes. No, I, I think that you're uh, correct about that. And it's one thing to work out a sort of formal logic of relativism where, okay, this looks like a coherent system and, and we can make sense of relativistic truth. That's not a reason to be a relativist. I mean, that's just kind of drawing up formal models. If you want to be a relativist, you need some motivation for it. And I think one kind of motivation comes from what you're uh, discussing, which is what are we using as the basic belief acquiring methods in order to generate our theories about the world. Uh, perception, obviously, is one kind of basic belief acquiring method, but there's others as well. Uh, for instance, in the moral domain, we often rely on rational intuition to try to determine you know, which moral propositions we think are the, the fundamental uh, truths that we're then going to try to spin out into a broader theory of deontology or whatever we've got going here. And revelation uh, in the, the theistic tradition is another kind of source of basic beliefs. Well, if we're unable to adjudicate among basic belief acquiring methods, which we kind of are because they're basic belief acquiring methods, we don't have a more fundamental method to select among those methods, right? And as long as we can build internally coherent theories out of those that might be incompatible with each other, well, then it, then maybe we kind of wind up with a little bit of an argument for relativism, right? We, we've got incompatible belief, basic belief acquiring methods, which we generate broad theories that we can hold in reflective equilibrium out of them, but these theories are incompatible with each other which should we prefer? We don't have a method to decide. Well, maybe they're both right. And then, then that's relativism. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Okay, so I also know that in your work you already talked a little bit about the relationship between uh, morality and moral relativism and evolutionary psychology and some of the evolutionary principles that uh, people in in the field and other adjacent fields discovered, like kin selection, reciprocal altruism, and things like that. So, right. uh, uh, f uh, from a strictly evolutionary psychological perspective, is it really possible for us to say that morality is objective or is relative, let's say? Right, right. Well... <clears throat> I th what's interesting to me is that if you think about why we have the moral intuitions that we do, that we're able to give an evolutionary psychological explanation of the most basic intuitions that we have. And coming out of the idea of kin selection, where we tend to favor, uh, behaviorally favor those that we regard as kin, it looks like that we're going to be getting agent relative intuitions out of this. That somehow I have special obligations to my family or to my friends or, or to those that might be kin with me that I don't have to strangers, I don't have to the world at large. All right, well, that gives rise to an entire class of moral theories, right? Uh, agent relative theories. On the other hand, we also get evolved reciprocal altruism, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. and that seems to give rise to agent-neutral moral theories, because as strangers, we interact with each other in certain kinds of ways, and we might be uh, in game-theoretic ways, and you don't have to be kin for me, or for me to think of you as kin, to 
treat you in certain sorts of ways, and, and perhaps you'll treat me reciprocally in, in various uh, uh, respects. So we build out of that agent neutral moral theory. Well, I have some duties towards you. I think that you're going to have some duties towards me. We're not related to each other. And then, of course, we wind up with uh, agent neutral moral theory. So I think even the way that our psychologies have evolved to have moral instincts are deeply at odds with each other. And in a way that I don't think can be reconciled, because I have innately agent neutral moral instincts and agent relative ones, well, what am I going to do now? I mean, some people want to take that and say, well, we should be moral skeptics. I mean, we just have inconsistent intuitions built into us by evolution. What do you want? I mean, morality is not a real thing. I mean, another possibility is to say, well, maybe moral relativism is the way to go. And there's just incompatible uh, moral theories that are, are true ways of understanding the world. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, this is very complicated, and I'm not sure if, if what I'm going to say now is correct or not. But I guess that when it comes to agent neutral approaches, that they really get a hold on people and get expanded when we include uh, cultural processes in the picture. Like, for example, uh, social institutions that really uh, communicate and impose uh, moral norms on people because otherwise it seems to me that from a purely biological perspective we wouldn't get past uh, some level that I'm not sure what it would be but yeah I think I see where we're going I, I'm not sure what to say about that there's certainly uh, cultural um, impositions if you will that demand a kind of agent neutrality. On the other hand, there are more local social groups, various kinds of tribes, churches, things like this, where I may think that I have special obligations towards the fellow members of my tribe or the fellow members of my political party or my church or whatever it is that I may, may not have to outsiders. And those are uh, agent relative intuitions that are encouraged by those groups too. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, and even if we have the same sort of uh, moral bases or moral foundations that, that are common to the entire humanity across the world, right. let's say, and for people in different societies, because to develop the moral systems that we have set in place in different societies, we have perhaps different ecological conditions operating on people and different game theoretical approaches and things like that and the results we get are different then i mean it's it's really difficult to make a case even with the moral foundations being the same that morality is objective right uh yeah well i I, I guess maybe there's the distinction between thinking that morality is objective or non-objective versus the idea that morality is universal or absolute, right? right? Because even a relativist might say, look, I think morality is in one sense objective. There are objective moral truths. I just think that they're relative ones, you know, that they're indexed to these points of view or, or to these perspectives. Morality is still a legitimate objective phenomena or, or uh, uh, facts about the world. But so I, I guess I'd want to make that distinction between the absolute and relative distinction on the one hand and the objective, you know, or non-objective or non-real distinction on the other. Mm -hmm. And we still have the is ought dichotomy or distinction, sure. right? I, I mean, even if we were to uh, completely know what are the uh, biological slash evolutionary moral processes that operate on the subconscious minds of all people around the world, we couldn't really get from that to a moral system j just through the description of those facts, right? Yeah, okay, I see where you're going. Yes, good, good. Yeah, because we're definitely going to need... We're going to need some philosophizing that's going to take us from, hey, here's some 
facts about human psychology to why should we think this is telling us anything about morality. And that's really where moral epistemology comes in. How is it that we're going to have knowledge of these moral facts at all? And once we understand something about, well, where are, are the non-inferential beliefs coming from that we're then using to build moral theories out of, and we get that moral epistemology going, I mean, that's kind of the bridge between those uh, non-normative facts and the normative ones. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I mean, when it comes to certain people trying to make a case for moral realism in the sense that, for example, if we have certain instincts like the survival instinct or the reproduction instinct, perhaps they would say that one of the premises of the argument would be we ought to survive or we ought not to die. But, but I mean, can, can we really derive that moral premise just from the fact that perhaps uh, processes of natural selection predispose us to prefer continuing living or preferring not to die. Right. Well, and that I think is where the moral skeptics want to pipe up and say, well, no, we can't. And since that's the only basis that we have for developing morality, we should think that morality is no more than you know some sort of uh, rationalization of these evolved instincts and that there's no fat mo no moral facts at all i mean and, and you know so that's just what the skeptics want to make out but I, I think that you could have a kind of more sophisticated view where you say look some of our instincts i'm going to say don't properly reflect our best understanding of morality, even though I recognize that in the end I'm grounding all of our moral theory or all the moral theory I want to support on moral intuition. I mean, the, the analogy would be to perception, where even though our science is based on our perceptions, at the same time, we sometimes write off our perceptions as being non-veridical or being mistaken precisely because they don't conform with our best scientific theories. So we think, look, the theory is so good, our perceptions had to have been, you know, mistaken or messed up in some kind of way. Then we say, well, I didn't actually see the thing I thought that I saw because I know it goes against science. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I mean, I guess that there's a big problem with approaches like the one that Peter Singer had in the expanding circle, because I mean, uh, when it gets, when he gets to the point of saying that because we have certain moral intuitions and through rational processes, we would inevitably expand our moral circle to include uh, all people, uh, the entire humanity. I, I mean, uh, th does it really follow? Because, I, I mean, we could decide to stop at any stage that we want. I mean, we could include just ourselves, just our family, our friends, right, our right. community. Right. I mean, we're not obliged just through rational processes to uh, continuing expanding the circle until all people are included in it, right? I think that's exactly right. I mean, Singer has very strong uh, agent-neutral moral instincts, and I think he doesn't really know why, hey, why doesn't everyone just have these uh, intuitions and no others? But obviously the, the agent-relative intuitions are strong and powerful ones. You know, the, the idea that, yeah, maybe I should worry about feeding my children before feeding the children of strangers, even if they're, they are hungrier. I mean, Singer may just not have that intuition, but loads of people do. And I think we need to acknowledge that and understand why we have those feelings. And, okay, well, and what kind of morality comes out of that as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, we can't really say, at least in a straightforward way, that for someone to decide to favor first their family and second other people, that that's wrong, right? Yeah, that's right, that's right. And, and certainly there's no obvious uh, path to thinking that those kind of uh, agent-relative theories must be mistaken. I mean, people argue against them, sure, but... Um, they're still going strong, you know. 
<laughs> yeah, right. O okay, so yeah. Dr. Hales, let's end the interview here. But just before we go, would you like to tell people what are perhaps some of the best places on the internet if they want to get in touch with you and more of your work? Sure. I mean, I'm easy to reach at uh, hales at bloomu.edu. Feel free to shoot me an email, and I'm easily locatable. My website is online. And, yeah, if anyone wants to uh, communicate with me more about this, I'm happy to talk. Okay, great. So I will be leaving links to all of that and to the rest of your work in the description box of the video, Dr. Hales, and also, of course, to your books that I referred to in the introduction. Uh, and so I would really like to thank you again for taking the time to be here with us today. It was really a pleasure to have you on the show. So. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks so much for asking me. Hi everybody, thank you so much for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would really like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Uh, otherwise, if you don't like Patreon, you can also go to PayPal or Subscribestar. All of the links are in the description box of the video and also on my channel. Uh, and apart from that, you can also, of course, leave a like, share the interview and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perelga Larson, La Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Jim Frank, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, and my first producer, Isar Webe. Thank you for all.